So with that, um, it's my pleasure to introduce our first speaker, Barry Thomas. So Barry is a senior associate dean of the Tippy College of Business at the University of Iowa and a professor in the business analytics group there. He has a PhD and master's degree in industrial and operations engineering from the University of Michigan. And his research focuses on applications of machine learning to last mile delivery problems, as well as a number of other topics. He's the co-area editor for routing and logistics in the journal Transportation Science and previously served as president of the Informs Transportation and Logistics Society. He was also on the Grinnell College Board of Trustees and Barry, we're happy to have you here. Thank you. All right, well, thank you very much uh, for having me today and, and Jan and Larry for organizing and inviting me and, and bringing such a, a great group of people uh, together. And uh, I especially want to thank uh, Sarah Wing, who, uh, for those of us, I think, who were invited speakers, did just a tremendous job uh, making this uh, a really smooth experience. So I really thank her for the time that she spent uh, uh, doing that. And, and I must admit, uh, I'm extremely excited to be here. This is my first conference uh, in person in the last two years. Um, I actually gave up tickets to the Packer Bears game last night uh, to come here. I'm originally from Green Bay. So um, you know, that, that tells you something about, um, you know, how, how excited I was uh, to be here. And, and I, I appreciate the opportunity to go first. I assume it's because Larry and Jan thought that we could start with a, an application that everybody understood, or, or perhaps it was just, we're going to set the bar low and uh, we'll make everybody else look, look good. So um, I want to talk about work uh, that, that's been going on for the last few years. Um, with a number of colleagues, and I think, uh, importantly, uh, my former P PhD student, Chen Wei Chen, who is, who is here visiting from uh, Bucknell, as well as my colleague at the University of Iowa, uh, Tong Wong, and uh, a frequent co-author of mine, Marlon Umer, who's now at uh, the University of Magdeburg in, in Germany. And, um, you know, this, I've been working on these same-day delivery problems um, for a while, and in many ways, perhaps my whole career, though we weren't thinking of them in that same day delivery context uh, at that time. But I'm sure, you know, all of you have have experienced this, whether, uh, you know, it's been, you know, your grocery delivery or your, your Amazon Prime now. And, you know, not probably surprising to any of us, right, over the pandemic, um, the growth was significant in these services, because many people were, you know, trying not to to go out and these kind of became, you know, the ways that, that we went to restaurants or for many people, the way that they were getting, um, you know, groceries uh, during the pretty much, you know, the height of the pandemic in, in 2020. And as a result, there's now a lot of, um, you know, just like many other things that, you know, were accelerated even as a result of the pandemic, that has been the case with the, the same day delivery market, that what, what people thought would take 10 years has now happened in, in two. And the expectation is that there will continue to be you know, significant growth. And then I think for all of us, then that means that there are significant opportunities for us to examine right, the, the, the operations of these. Many of you are also probably aware and predating kind of a lot of this growth is there has also been a lot of concern though about uh, you know same day delivery particularly because um, it was noticed pretty early on particularly with Amazon that there were certain neighborhoods that were not finding themselves um, having these services available to them and so that it becomes this this interesting question then is you know, how do we make this um, so that we serve these neighborhoods? And, and I think it's important, though, to kind of look at what does this mean for, for not serving these neighborhoods? And for that, I want to go back to work that, that uh, Chin Wei did that kind of predates the, the work that I'm going to talk about here. And in this case, we were kind of, we were really interested in this question because there's a lot of thought about, you know, what role drone delivery might play in, in, in deliveries. And so we were looking at heterogeneous fleets of of drones and, and sort of trucks to see how they would interact and in, in terms of delivery. And so what we see on the, the X axis here is um, this is sort of a cross 
the day. You can think of it starting at like 8 a.m. is zero. And then, you know, we move through the day. And on the y-axis, that is the travel time of a vehicle to a customer service request. And one of the things that you'll see happen as we get to the end of the day, you'll notice that there are all these X's. And these are customers who requested service um, whom we were unable to serve. And there might be two reasons for that. One, um, that it simply became infeasible. We didn't have the resources left, right, to get to these customers before the end of the, the, the workday or the delivery period, right? It's a common um, right, constraints. The other thing that you might do though, is you might not, right? If you're Amazon, these folks come to your website, you know who they are because they're signed in. And so there's certain things you might not show them. You might not show them the availability of same day service, and they might have to then take service the next day or not at all. Right. And, uh, yeah. So the height is the distance from the depot, the amount of time from the depot that it would take to travel to that customer. So, and so I'll, and I'm just about to highlight this, right? So what you see is it's customers who are farther away, right? They're customers that consume more of our delivery resources that are being unserved. And, and of course there is, a, there is a conscious choice going on there because where you locate your depot right, to serve these customers is going to impact who's farther away, and, and you're likely to locate a depot in an area, right, where you have more density of, uh, you know, whether it's profit or, or customers in general. But, it, you know, it, I think that a lot of people were thinking that there might be sort of racial or other kinds of discrimination, but in fact, we didn't have anything of that that would have shown up in our in our own algorithms or, or data sets. And it simply becomes a function of, right, the algorithm. You could, this is a form of algorithmic bias. And in fact, I just argue, it's simply the bias of the objective that's trying to maximize, in this case, the expected number of services that we were able to provide. So when we saw this, we kind of turned to this question, can we provide a fairer service? Can we make it more likely that a larger group of people are going to experience that service. And this was motivated in part by this idea that there were people, particularly right, older folks, who, for whom during the pandemic, this was probably the best way for them to you know, get things from, from stores, whether it was grocery or meal delivery or, or other kinds of delivery, because they were the most vulnerable population. In the, in the pandemic. So it made sense to us to, to ask, right, can we kind of, can we sort of broaden the group that's going to have access to these services? And so I'll come back to this question of fair because we do need to define what it means uh, to be fair. And there's a lot of different ways we can do that. We used a particular definition. And let me, to do that, let me sort of lay, give you kind of a sense of what the problem looks like. So as I've been talking about, we have this right depot and we're going to have vehicles, right? Drivers that, that kind of serve customers from these locations. And then what happens over the course of the day is that you get different requests, right? And these are both spatially and temporally, you know, dispersed throughout the day. You don't necessarily know about them in advance. You might have a probability distribution, right? On maybe individual customers, but probably, you know, areas within your, you know, delivery zone. And in, in some cases, um, these, you know, these services are associated with, you know, delivery deadlines, like we're going to get this to you within two hours or four hours is, is fairly frequent. So then what we need to do is, you know, we need to begin making decisions as the service provider as to who it is that we are going to serve and how we are going to serve them, right? And so when we do that, when I make this decision to go to that first customer who's requested service, what I don't know is what's going to happen during the rest of the day. So once I make that decision, 
I've now constrained my future, right? At a minimum, there's an opportunity cost to me to making that decision. Making that decision, one, to even serve that customer, and two, how I'm going to serve that customer. So if I decide it's the beginning of the day, I'm going to go out and I'm just going to you know, serve this customer singly, which actually in some cases is a pretty good idea. You want to do work while you're waiting for other requests to happen, right? That now means for the next two requests that occur, I'm kind of constrained. They've got to, they, they aren't going to be served with this particular customer. And I've sort of lost in that case, a consolidation opportunity, particularly between those two customers on the right-hand side. It also means, right, that this customer who requests fourth and, and might be a little bit further away, well, in the end, that customer may end up unserved. And that, that might be for two of the reasons. As I mentioned, it might be because that has become infeasible. It's just, I don't have the resources or I'm just not going to offer services because I might wanna preserve resources for future requests that are either more valuable or themselves consume fewer resources. Meaning as I'm maximizing an objective as a company would of, of maximizing profit or maximizing the number of people I serve, right? That I'll be able to serve more in the future. So what we looked at then in terms of fairness was this idea that um, customers could be in different regions of the, the service area. So we partition this service area. And then what we seek to do in terms of fairness is maximize the minimum regional service rate. So what we want to do is bring up the service rate in the, in, in the region that was most, right, had the lowest rate if we were to be ignoring fairness. So this is one measure of fairness, right? And we've, we, I'm specifically focusing on fairness and not say equity, right? Equity would imply that every region gets equal service, for instance. Well, one, that's nearly impossible to achieve. Um, but you can, in fact, have a feasible solution in that case where I serve absolutely nobody. So in this case, this is why we settled on, you know, this particular, you know, definition of what it meant to be fair. So, um, but we had to couple that because, right, the, the companies obviously need to, to turn a profit. And so what we also needed to look at was we wanted to maximize the total service rate. That is, we're maximizing, right, the, as well, the expected number of customers that we're able to serve. And you could easily do that as sort of a profit-wise as well, but we're just simplifying and, and wanted to look at it in this particular context. So what that means is that we have this sort of multi-objective problem and we formulate that objective you know, simply as a, a convex combination of these two measures, right? Of total utility and the fairness. Yes. Right. So we can choose the, the region, right? And so that becomes, I, at this point, I've left that exogenous and just assuming it happens. And in the, as I'll show you in some of the computational experiments we were doing it, it, it we made them sort of obvious kinds of partitions, but that would certainly be sort of a follow-up question, like what should these regions look like? I, I, I think that's absolutely right. So uh, I come to this, this space of, of problems from an operations research background. And so, right, I, I think of this first as a Markov decision process problem, right? I need to make a sequence of decisions over time in, in sort of this dynamic stochastic environment. So, and, and I wanna, I'm, I'm, many of you are probably familiar with these concepts, but I want to touch on this as I go along, um, kind of as I, partly as I think about this intersection of sort of the optimization and the machine learning that's going on. And so to set that stage, right, a solution, to a Markov decision process is a policy. I'm going to map the state of the world, the things I know about the world 
I'm going to map that to a decision. Sometimes we call that an action. And then an optimal solution, right, is going to be a particular policy that maximizes my expected reward, right, across the horizon. Now, in this case, remember that reward has two components. It has a component related to the, the total utility, and it has a component related to the fairness because that's a it's a multi-objective um, consideration. And then, as many of you are probably familiar, and this is how most people think of you know, a Markov decision process or a dynamic program in general, right? The optimal policy is going to satisfy, right? Bellman's equation. That's sort of the famous, right? Recursion that we have for um, Markov decision processes. And then, right, we, we know, right? This is what we learn in our textbooks as undergrads that we solve that by backward induction. Well, um, that's true, right? And, and there we kind of can greedily select the action from a given state that's going to maximize our expected reward. The challenge in a problem like this though, is that we have, right, massive state space and you end up with, um, you know, the famous cursive dimensionality in the state space because it's a, right, you have a vectored state space and it, right, you have many vehicles, you have many customers at any given time and so on. Right, but we're here. I'm going to actually talk about the curses of dimensionality, and this is a, a concept that is, if you know Warren Powell, he talks about this, you know, frequently, and it's it's certainly something that comes up in a problem like this. So, what that leads us to do, right, is if we're if we're going to solve this problem, we need to do that in an approximate way, and we need to have an approximation of that cost to go. So, in fact, we no longer do a backward recursion we're actually stepping forward in time and making and, and solving that Bellman equation based on this approximation. So in our case, we're gonna learn those approximate values using deep Q learning. And in fact, in, in Q learning, right, we're actually approximating the entire second term, not just those, right, the, the individual V of S case plus ones. So the thing is, right, that deep Q learning is really, uh, in, in my experience, has been really effective for large state spaces. And you, we saw this, right, with the superhuman performance um, on Atari, for instance. The thing about Atari, and I'm probably one of the few people, Larry, yeah, not to call you guys out, that remember what an Atari was, but an Atari joystick, right, had basically eight positions, plus you could press the button. So there's really 16 actions that you can take at any given time, right? Well, a problem like this has an embedded routing problem. So you have, in fact, a very complicated embedded combinatorial optimization problem. So Q learning is not terribly well suited and not suited at all for that kind of, um, kind of problem. So one of the things that we did in this work, and this is something I, I, I wanna emphasize a little bit because I think it's really important as um, you know, we kind of bring together the communities that are working on this, is we had to make a decision as to what the action was, it's a multidimensional action that we were gonna solve for with our, our deep Q learning. And what we decided to do was we were gonna limit the Q learning to making decisions about whether or not we were gonna offer service to a particular customer who made a request. So, I mean, it's probably, you, you probably picked up pretty quick. You're like, oh, well, that's a, that's a pretty simple decision, right? It's, it's, it's binary, right? True. So, um, and then we later would augment this and we were able, in a fleet of vehicles, we could determine which vehicle it should be served by if we were going to offer that service. So we, we dramatically simplified the action space that we were going to deal with. To do that, though, we somehow still had to manage the routing. 
And we managed the routing just using a heuristic that operated sort of outside of the, the actual Q learning. And so I think this is, you know, from somebody like, like me who's coming to this from the operations research side and kind of the broader context of, of approximate dynamic programming, I think there's some really interesting things going on here because we default, I think, in, in kind of the current environment because of the success that it's had to sort of this deep learning. But there are other ways of doing this, these approximations that would lend themselves to being able to also solve the combinatorial optimization problem. So instead of using a neural net, I could have used like a linear function, right? And learned the coefficients on a linear function and I can embed that in an IP, right? So then I could take advantage of all the technology we have in integer programming to solve right, these combinatorial optimization problems. So there's, there's decisions that you have to make when you solve these. And there, there's incredible power in something like you know, using a deep neural net, but you know, we're sort of giving up a little bit, at least in the way that we currently you know, are able to solve these things. And I get it, you can, you can pull right, the, and, and model out the, the neural net that you have. right. You can embed that in a math program. It's a lot of variables and a lot of constraints that get added. So, right, there's a lot of work here that, that's yet to be done. So I've digressed there because I'll, I'll continue on this. But so from that standpoint, I think the other kind of interesting thing is that we were able to get kind of incredible performance without, you know, doing anything, you know, really fancy in terms of deep learning, right? We used a feed forward neural net we had two layers, there were 50 neurons each in there. And we played around with that sort of different, you know, numbers. And, and this, you know, kind of gave us that balance of um, kind of performance as well as, as training. Um, and then we just used simple, you know, um, ReLU activation functions. So we didn't have to do anything really, um, you know, kind of on the cutting edge of, these kind, of, these kind of techniques in order to get really good performance. Um, what I do want to note, though, is something in the features that became really interesting. Because as I mentioned, right, we had to, we, we had to sort of take that routing piece out of there. So one of the things we looked at, right, is as we were doing the features, some of these things were, were kind of obvious, right? If you think about, we needed to know the time of the day. We, it was really helpful to know what region a customer was in and the distance that that customer had you know, from the depot. We needed to know things about the fleet of vehicles, like you know, they're out on the road, when will they come back to the depot? Because in a same day delivery problem, right, you have sort of these, multi, it's, it's called a multi-trip routing problem because you have multiple trips back and forth right, to the depot. So you have to know when they're coming back because that tells you something about your ability to serve that customer. But then the other thing we were able to do here is because we had the routing heuristic on the outside, we could test feasibility before we would run this. And of course, we just had to reject a customer that was infeasible given the deadline. But if you know, it was feasible to serve it, one of the things we could do is we, could, and we now knew things about what we'd want to do if we served it. And so we knew, for instance, kind of the added time it would take to serve that customer. And we could embed that into the features. And what that allowed us to do, it gave us a connection between that routing heuristic and the decision-making that was going on in our, in our neural net, right? And so I think that was, we found this, we kind of just stumbled upon this at one point in previous work. And it became sort of a, it was really effective in terms of um, helping us gain performance and, and learn. And then we also embedded into there kind of the current status of, um, of fairness, right? What is the minimum, what is currently the minimum, um, uh, the region that's achieving the minimum service rate and what is that service rate? And that also gave us some additional discriminating power within this um, neural net. Now, the other thing, yeah, question? Uh, what type of training do you do there? Uh, 
Yeah, so we were we were using synthetic data in this case, and we were running, you know, simulations, and I'll I'll get to that in a minute um, that that we used um, for this kind of thing. So the other thing that turns out, right, and this is in hindsight, and it's kind of obvious, but initially, it just we didn't think about it initially. But one of the things that we wanted to operate on, right, as I mentioned, we were operating on these rates, right, like we're maximizing the utility, the total service rate, we're maximizing fairness, which is, right, the maximum of the minimum service rates, or the minimum service rate. Well, as you go through, right, these are over the course of a day. So over the course of the day, that denominator keeps changing. And so it really led to enormous um, volatility. And that, re as I say, average reward there, that's average reward of that combined objective, which is essentially the, uh, right, so the utility and the, the, the fairness, but the reward is sort of a marginal change in that, right, at each decision. And you can just see that it goes to zero as you go across, as you simulate across a day. And so you really just couldn't, you couldn't learn anything with this. So we had to go and, and it's essentially, you know, not surprisingly, we kind of had to normalize along the objective. So not just the features, but we needed to normalize uh, in the objective. That's really easy to do if you're doing just maximum utility, right? I can just count the services. And so I just get sort of the marginal, you know, from, from decision to decision, I'm just adding up the services that I'm doing. And that's really natural. And that's actually how we would normally solve this problem. We had to turn around and essentially do the same thing where we started to kind of, if you will, incrementally build up the fairness in the same way. And so it, it, we ended up with this proxy um, kind of re, uh, proxy function within the, the neural network, but you can see, right, the modified objective actually learned something. So that, that was a important finding, I think, for us in, in this particular work. So here, here's, a, here's how we we did this, we created some environments that would in general, you know, not, there would be geographies in which certain customers would be much less likely to be served because they would be expensive to serve. So we created a number of different geographies. In the first case there on the, which we called uh, the dist, right? We have sort of a, a region in the middle where you don't have a lot of, customers happening. And, and that could be a case of, you know, a place like Iowa City, where you have a downtown, um, maybe people aren't living there, and people sort of live around that. But in that case, we, we put the depot in one region, but we had the same um, density of customer requests between, you know, both the top and bottom regions one and two. In the other case, we put the depot in the middle, but then the top region had a much lower density, right? And so density matters in a same day delivery problem because it allows you to have more, it, it creates a likelihood that customers who are requesting, right, are near one another. And you want that because that allows you to consolidate requests onto a single vehicle, right? Meaning that you can reduce trips back and forth to the depot and you're taking advantage, right, of the the, the lack of that deadhead. So we, um, so we created these kinds of environments and then we simulated, you know, using different parameters and really focused, you know, we had a baseline policy here when alpha was zero, that meant we essentially ignored fairness in the objective, right? So this would be the case of just simply having a profit maximizing objective. And so, you know, it shouldn't be a surprise that fairness and total utility are, are naturally at odds. But, right, if we can just setting that alpha parameter, right, that's the, the parameter that, that's driving the convex combination, setting that sort of at about 0.5, you can see that, you know, the, the blue line there is sort of the, the total utility, right, the total number of services we're providing you can see that, yes, we do lose something, but it's not a tremendous loss in terms of profit 
while at the same time, we can dramatically bring up the minimum service rate. So we can provide the region that was otherwise achieving the minimum with a much higher level of service at, at a not terribly high cost. So just remember that for a minute, because I'm gonna come back to this. The other thing that's interesting is that it can allow your, as a company, to think about right, depot location. Because today, many of these companies, right, whether it's Walmart, certainly the groceries, but others, are now doing the fulfillment for those same day deliveries out of their brick and mortar. So as they think about where to locate the brick and mortar, right, it, it you know, traditionally would have been, right, whether it's in a, you know, an area of the highest density, or, or maybe, you know, it's in a Walmart outlot because a lot of customers come there, those kinds of things. Um, it becomes an interesting question of how this would affect kind of the optimal location um, from a same day delivery standpoint. So it turns out if you're going to do, right, if you're going to do same day delivery, you, right, if, if you want to maximize just utility, right, and, and you generally would do that for the case of people coming to your store as well, you want to be in the middle of that populous region, that region too. But it turns out we can, we can achieve, we can also achieve the fairness by shifting this depot just a little bit closer, not all the way, but just a little bit closer to the other regions of customers that we'd be serving. And so this suggests that you don't have to give up a lot in terms of your brick and mortar either in order to achieve more fairness when you're doing the, the same day delivery. But finally, I think the, the other thing we have to talk about is the fact that, you know, other than, than maybe Congress coming down on, on Amazon for, these, for maybe not being perceived as fair, there's also the question of how does this fairness work from a business standpoint, right? Because at the end of the day, that company still needs to satisfy its shareholders. So one of the things that we looked at was the likelihood that if you are a customer who is not being served, right? You're just not being offered service. At a certain point, you're just not gonna try to use that service, right? So your likelihood of making a request will decline over time as you are repeatedly denied service. So we took that into account and we started changing the arrival rates in regions that were based on the likelihood that that customer, a customer in that region would receive service. And so not surprisingly, as we saw in that early picture, if you are um, you know, a customer in one of the less desirable regions, less desirable in the sense it's farther away, it consumes more resources to serve, Right. If we don't, if we ignore fairness, you will see that over time, those customers begin to drop out. And so over time, our overall utility is declining as those customers drop out. But if we consider fairness, right, that's the right hand side picture. Well, you'll notice that we're able to keep our total utility over the course of the horizon, right, basically over the course of a year. Oh, it's also higher, right? And thus higher overall returns than you get if we would allow, right? If we're not trying to serve those customers. So thinking of fairness, it can have sort of this, you know, kind of social justice context, but thinking about it this way, it also in, in this context, it also has sort of long-term implications for the bottom line. So I think there's an opportunity here that, you know, the companies thinking about this kind of have a win-win, but it's also, I think, important from an algorithmic standpoint or really setting our objectives, you know, and we often think of those objectives on kind of just the, you know, the long run average on a daily basis, but there are other implications of that. So kind of broadening our perspective of, of what it means when we, we set that objective, I think is, is also really valuable. All right, and I know Larry's about to, Give me the hook. So why don't we um, kind of go, go to the end here? Like, where do, where, where do we go from here? So I think, 
the, the, next, the other way to think about this, right, is we've sort of provided this fairness. I think there's also an opportunity if you were to provide priorities for certain groups. I was thinking particularly the elderly here um, who are at high risk during the pandemic. You could sort of do exactly that in the same framework that we've, we've done here. It's also interesting that a lot of the work on fairness in terms of routing is, is about the drivers. It's about driver workload. And you want, you know, in these sort of gig economies, you want everybody over time to have about the same workload because that means they earn about the same, right? You treat them equally. So there's a lot of, there, there's the, you know, the interest in that as well. And could you combine that into these kinds of multi-objective um, Frameworks, and then you know where I kind of had interjected in the middle of the talk, you know, could we do more advanced optimization of the customer acceptance and the routing, right? And all of these things need to be done within that framework of a sequential stochastic decision making problem. So they're 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 complicated, and are there are there going to be better ways, right, to embed that combinatorial optimization into these kinds of frameworks. So I will, you know, stop there and uh, entertain a couple minutes of questions. So thank you. Yes, please. In the Q&A box, First one is how to get the dropout data. Is the data collected online? So in this case, it was synthetic data. We didn't we didn't collect the data uh, in this particular case. And I think as we get into the panel later today, I'll kind of preview some, you know, a thought on that. One of the challenges I think that we find is that you, no matter what you do, you could collect data, you know, in a real world environment, but there's there's never going to be enough to train something like a deep neural network using reinforcement learning. So you're gonna to have to build a simulator around that no matter what you do um, and, and bootstrap that or fit distributions, but you're not gonna have a choice but to do something like that. Um, thank you. You know, I was uh, interested in your last conclusion there that fairness can be good business, but wouldn't that also be a function of the uh, kind of the economic value of those remote customers? I mean, they could be very, uh, you know, you could get really large orders from yep. locations that are very remote or not. So how did you uh, include that notion of the economic worth of customers wherever they are? So, so at this point, yeah, I, I mean, we, we played around with that, but the, the, what I'm showing you here, I was treating every customer in, in essence the same, right? I wasn't looking at um, kind of their profit and, and more importantly to, to you know, a lot of these companies to an Amazon, right? It's not your, your individual order. It's actually sort of your, your sort of lifetime value to them, right? So, um, and so that then becomes an interesting question because that's really hard to measure, of course. Even if they know who you are, they probably, I'm, I'm sure they can, can forecast that in some way. But, you know, the, the, there's also the question of, right, that, do they really want to long-term start ignoring entire, you know, sets of customers, even if they are of lower value? And I think that's a, that's an interesting question, right? Best Buy did that in their stores, you know, about 10 years ago, where there were, there were certain customers who were buying things, returning them, and they just became really expensive. And they, they did say, we don't want to serve those. I don't think every company has, has made that same decision. And so that's why we were thinking of it in terms of, you know, just the, providing the service, but I think, I think it's an important question and I, it, it's definitely something that we can embed into this kind of model. So. Another question from chat box is, can you reverse the story? If you accounted in drop off in customers in profit maximization, it would produce more fairness? Uh, I'm not sure I understand the, the question. So that, oh, if by reducing I see. By by reducing the uh, drop off and yeah, by reducing the the total utilization, do I end up with more fairness? Yeah. So what happens is though that who you're losing 
are the customers that were not being served. So they're just not coming back. So it, you're losing the customers who you were otherwise trying to be fair to. So I think it, it actually doesn't improve the situation. I think it exacerbates it because it leaves the customers you know, who you were otherwise making the decision to serve and you're losing the others. So I think it exacerbates in that sense, the, the lack of fairness that, that existed. So if I understand correctly, the accept reject decisions are made instantly, right? Correct. So I was thinking if there is a value in batching these uh, incoming orders and you make the decisions of like, let's say 15 minutes, you take a batch every 15 minutes and then solve the problem. So, so I've seen, I've seen that. Um, and I, I think that's one way to think about it. Our thinking was that as a consumer, I'm not going to wait 15 minutes for you to tell me whether or not you're going to serve me, right? Because I may have to make the decision to, you know, then go out and, you know, get whatever it is that I, I needed. So I think that, I, I think in practice, I'm, I'm not, it, I just don't think you would do that. Now, would that be beneficial? Absolutely. Because then, right, if I can wait and accumulate orders, I have more information and I can make better decisions. So anything you can do to wait a little bit to make that decision would have value to you, but would the consumer allow you to do that would be the, I think, the question. The routing decision certainly can be made after batching, right? Oh, so we, yes, you could do that. So you could, um, even if I reject, right, I could then update my routing decisions. We don't, we didn't do that here, but you absolutely could have done that. Yeah, right. You can re-optimize those as you go. Absolutely. All right. You're giving me the hook. All right. Thank you. Thank you, guys.